I'd like to call the Tuesday, December 1st, 2020 Papillion City Council meeting to order. Ms. Brown, would you please take the roll? Sunday? Here. Mumgard? Here. Gaines? Here. Glover? Here. Jaworski? Here. Kluke? Here. Stubbe? Here. Engberg? Here. And I'll just note for the public, um, they may see one council member missing, but he's on Zoom. The governor did pass an executive order that if somebody is quarantined or is positive that they're allowed to participate uh, virtually. And then he's issued a new updated executive order that we can actually have virtual meetings. And so probably starting with our December 15th meeting, we'll start doing a full Zoom meeting that includes public participation as well. Um, so any council members could uh, participate that way and still be full. So uh, would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There's a current copy of the Opens Meeting Act posted in the Council Chambers, and do we have an affidavit of publication on file? We do. We do. Thank you. And I'll just also note for those in the room. Um, Chambers is a small room and with social distancing, we've got a limited number of people in here um, because of various topics. We've got more people that want to be in the room, uh, probably both tonight and tomorrow night. And so if you've got a regular agenda item and your item is done and you don't want to hang around, feel free to leave. Um, you won't interrupt the meeting and that then will free, the, free a spot for somebody else to come in. And in regards to tomorrow night's uh, public hearing, um, if somebody's not in the room, they still will be given an opportunity to speak. We'll have officers managing the traffic for social distancing to get people in and out. So if you get any questions about, hey, the room's small, I couldn't get in, we will manage that tomorrow for the public hearing so they can come on in. We've got a special presentation tonight. I'd like to invite Lori Hansen, Amber Powers, Carrie Svensson, Tony Gowan, uh, Nancy and Tim are all going to share. Um, but um, those that are in the other room, if you'd go ahead and come on out. Um, Lori Hansen's been the city's recreation director forever, um, and she just retired. And so we want to take uh, an opportunity to, uh, to honor her. Where'd you go? Ah, come on up. I want to read a proclamation uh, to start off. Proclamation recognizing the retirement of Lori Hansen, 22 years of service to the city of Papillion. Whereas Lori Hansen began her appointment to the city of Papillion as recreation director on August 18th, 1998. Whereas Lori has been an invaluable asset to the city of Papillion and a key leader during a period of tremendous growth. Under her leadership, Papillion dreamt of, designed and opened the premier Papillion landing facility, which includes a community center and field house. And whereas Lori has dedicated countless hours to community recreation development and the city of Papillion has benefited greatly because of Lori's leadership in guiding the recreation department. And whereas Lori's tenacity and integrity in her position has earned the respect of city employees, elected officials and peers, and Lori has received numerous awards during her tenure. And whereas Lori's work has been highly valued and greatly appreciated through her years of service with the city and her leadership will continue to have an impact on the city of Papillion for years to come. Now, therefore, a David P. Black, Mayor of the City of Papillion, do hereby present this proclamation to express our sincere appreciation and gratitude to Lori Hansen for 22 years of dedicated service, countless contributions to the City of Papillion. We wish Lori the best in her retirement. Also a tradition to give our little iron butterfly, if people are not familiar with this, there's actually a limited supply and it is patented. Um, it was designed for a special project and then we found out how unique they were. And uh, I think Tony Gowan, or uh, I think it was Tony, might have worked then, or Jeff, I think, worked to get it patented, one of the guys. And uh, there was a limited run of the production as well. And so we don't give these out lightly, but I'd like to give Lori one. It just says presented December 1st, 2020 for 22 years of dedicated and faithful service to the citizens and staff of the city of Papillion. And I've got one more. Mayor's Outstanding Achievement Award presented to Lori Hansen in recognition of your visionary leadership team inspiration and commitment to the successful completion of the Papillion Landing Project, March 2020. We plan to give this at the grand opening, but the week of the grand opening, we shut it down because of COVID. So a little bit late, but uh, 
give this to you as well. Wow. I need another wall. <laughs> Amber, do you want to share? Yep, and I'll just mention that that's the second one that you've ever given. So, and Chris got the first, and Chris is here. Chris, did you want to share anything before I go? Okay, do you want to come up and share? Thanks for the opportunity. And again, I'm just following Mayor Black's lead and I saw him pull down his mask while he's talking. So I'm gonna do the same. Well, first of all, Lori, thank you for your 22 years of service and congratulations on your retirement. Um, I work with Lori the entire 22 years. The bulk of that time she reported to me. What I can tell you is I learned more from Lori about how to be a leader than I think you learned it from me. So again, congratulations. Lori, I know you'll still be around uh, because you're going to volunteer and help the rec department, right? Uh, right. <laughs> but when you're not around, just know that I'll think of you every time I hear a bad dad joke <laughs> or when someone fails miserably at trying to take a candid photo of people. Uh, but all jokes aside, I'll also think of you every time I go to the landing complex or when I take Palmer to Papio Bay. Uh, the mark you've left on this community will live on through many generations. Thank you. And staff meetings will never be as fun without your positive attitude there to lighten the mood. <laughs> it has been an absolute pleasure getting to know you both professionally and personally over the past three years. Know that you'll be greatly missed, but also know that you've earned today. You've earned your retirement. Enjoy it. Thanks. Hi, I'm Carrie Stinson, HR Director, and um, yeah, Lori is the reason we have the what's said at staff meetings stay at staff meetings. Um, Lori and I have worked together for 10 years of her 22. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with her and also become her friend. So probably more importantly, shortly after coming to work for the city, Lori and I had conducted some interviews together for an opening in the rec department. Do you remember? <laughs> After conducting those interviews, we made an offer to a candidate and they accepted, but they called in sick on their first day. Oh boy. So um, then they finally decided not to even take the job. So I'm not even sure to this day if I scared them off because I've been told I'm scary, but Lori also asked the question, who is your favorite cartoon character and why? So I don't know if that scared them off. <clears throat> she loves, she's someone that loves the people she works with. And I'm sure many of you have had a Lori hug. <laughs> she's not afraid to say what she's thinking and give people hugs. Um, not that those were ever HR approved, right? <laughs> she would say in frustration at times, there are just too many rules to follow. I can't keep up with all the rules. <laughs> she would say, and um, she just has this great sense of humor um, that with jokes to share, always a joke to share. We're really gonna miss all those jokes. Um, I know those weren't HR, HR approved. Um, Lori, I will miss you as many will. Um, enjoy your retirement, it's well earned and all the things that come with it and know that the rec department is your legacy. We'll save our tears for the golf course, all right? I'm Tony Gowan. I'm the Parks and Facilities Director here at the city. Been with the city for 27 years now. Uh, I think Nancy and I are probably the longest tenured department heads at this point in time. And this has happened a little too often lately, but we knew it was going to happen. We knew we were going to have a turnover and uh, we've tried to uh, internally recognize leaders that would come up and take over and uh, step in when we all start retiring and feeling our aches and pains and all that other fun stuff. But I just had a couple things to say about our esteemed colleague, Lori, uh, and our friend. Uh, as and many of you know, I'm a big fan of the Disney organization and Bob Iger wrote in his book lately, uh, just this past two years, as a leader, you are the embodiment of that company. What that means is this, your values, your sense of integrity, decency, and honesty, the way you comport yourself in the world, or a stand-in for the values of that company. Well, 
I will tell you for the years that Lori has served the city uh, and its residents, I think it's important to say the residents because you have served, you've been a shining light. Uh, the way you handle yourself, uh, the way you're a friend to all of us, I'm gonna miss that. And you've been just a great steward for the city. You know, leadership at its core is leading a group of people, sometimes successfully and sometimes not. And we've all been through the knot, but you lead. Lori has been a great leader for Papillion. She has hired an amazing staff and talented staff. And she has been at the forefront of bringing new ideas and innovations to the city. And she's always spoken her mind. I cannot tell you how much I respect that. Even when those thoughts were not popular, that's very difficult to help move the organization forward. But the one thing I count on for Lori is how she would use a positive attitude and a good natured way to go about her business. When tough times were put upon her, and there were many, you took over many tough things in this city and you did them well. But when tough times are put upon you and your staff, you always approach those times with smile, good humor, positive, and positive ideas to try to make the situation better. The true sign of a great leader. Lori, I'm gonna miss you. And so will the citizens of Papillion. You have led the recreation department with great results and leave it much better than when you found it. You should be very, very proud. So here's wishing you for giving greens, long drives and wide fairways, happy trails to greener pastures. Nancy, you wanna share? Is it on? Okay. Lori, I've been here your whole 22 years and then some. <laughs> um, it's, it's been a fun go. Um, the, the rec department, you know, it grew from a baby to this phenomenal thing. And as it grew, so did Lori's business and, and knowledge of how things ran. Um, she's the creative end of a spectrum and I'm the numbers person. So we, we've had our challenges, but you know what? You managed the largest construction project this city has ever seen. And we're getting ball fields in the first step, which were not originally um, planned for. Um, so we did control that budget. We've got the amenities that the community was looking for. So I think that's great. Now you can just go do your own little budget at home instead of having to deal with all these rec budgets, which I'm sure will make you greatly happy. And along there, I, I don't want people to forget Lori's ins and outs of the golf. I kind of called it the circle of golf. It wasn't part of rec when Lori started. And then we decided that we were going to manage the clubhouse internally and close to overnight, Lori became in charge of the golf courses. Um, and through her leadership skills has developed other people and the golf course got removed from the wreck and is standing on its own. Now you can just go play golf and have fun. I wish you well. I'm a little confused. I love my job, but I keep seeing people that started after I did retiring and I'm a little bit envious. <laughs> You can't retire. No, I can't. I got two teenagers. <laughs> Way to leave the, the worst person last. <laughs> I'm Tim Moran with the Recreation Department. I've worked with Lori my entire career. Um, I have something written here. I'll just read right from it, Lori. You've been way too, uh, more to me than just a boss. You've been a sister, an aunt, and many times a mother to me. I'm extremely lucky to have had you in my life. You know all my secrets and stories. I tend not to remember yours. For so long, we've been a two-person team. It, will be not, it won't be the same without you. I tried to think of some funny, funny, embarrassing story about you, but none were appropriate for this setting. And there's just way too many to tell. Everyone can imagine the fun times we've had over the last 18 years together. I can say that you are no longer allowed to torture me or make me steal any signs. 
You've taught me everything I know. You've molded me into the person I am today, and I'm very grateful to have you as my mentor. Your guidance and encouragement has helped me and so many others in this city thrive. Over Lori's time with the city, she's not only managed several projects and programs, she has created numerous relationships and memories with everyone that she has worked with and met throughout the years. She's just one of those people that can get along with just about anybody, unless you're a Bears or Packer fan. <laughs> Lori, I wanted to let you know I nominated you for an award with the Nebraska Parks and Recreation Association. And even though they have not announced that award yet, I can be the first to tell you that because of your professionalism, dedication and passion for the field of parks and recreation, the 2020 Distinguished Service Award will be awarded to Lori Hansen. And the RPA will be announcing these awards later on this month and the plaque will be coming to Lori. You are retiring from the City Pavilion and Recreation Department, but you're not retiring for your love of parks and recreation. You've inspired so many people in this profession that your legacy will be here for a long time. As your friend, I can truly say you will be missed, but myself and all the rest of us at the Recreation Department are so happy for you. You deserve it. You know I love you and I wish you nothing but the best in your retirement. Please don't be a stranger. I'm always ready for a round of golf. Thank you. Before I ask Lori to share something, just want to see if there's any council members that want to share. Have a good long night. Lori, you want to say a few words? Well, you won't catch me very often on the short end of the word spectrum. But I had to write a couple things down or I was going to forget. And I probably still will forget what I want to say. First of all, I want to introduce my Omaha family. We got Sue, and Andrew, and Harper here. Alyssa, Andrew's wife, is working health care, working hard and long hours right now as a nurse. Um, very, 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 very happy that they were able to be here tonight. And I don't want to get emotional, but damn it. Um, 2020 has been a real challenge, you know. Um, we had this great big place that we opened up and it was going guns of fire and was exceeding all of our expectations. And, and then boom, you know, it comes to a screeching halt. And in the middle of all of that, you know, trying to personally and professionally really takes a toll out. And even though professionally, the city's always gonna do right by us here. We're gonna work hard and we're gonna always be able to come through that. I always felt a little bit cheated. I felt a little bit cheated. I felt cheated that we didn't get the open house. I felt cheated that we couldn't have my beer at my retirement reception. And I felt really, really cheated that my family and my friends weren't able to come here and see what an amazing group of people I get to work with every day. Um, I, I mean, I've loved it here. I love it here. I loved all of you. And um, I just can't read right now. I wonder where I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be saying something. Um, I, thought, I thought today that I'd have the car packed and ready to head to Palm Springs, you know, and, and that didn't work out either, but it will in all in, in time. But I really, really sincerely mean it that I, I cared for you all from the bottom of my heart. And I loved every minute of it here with the exception of maybe a time when I almost got fired because I didn't make popcorn right. But that was another story for another day. Um, but um, I, like I said, I've loved every minute here. What a great team. You guys are all amazing. You're all my friends. My team is my family. Um, it's been a great, great ride. And city council members and elected officials, I can't tell you what it's meant to me to have your support and your guidance and your confidence, you know, 
you know, you talk about, I don't get all the credit for that big building being built there. There was a whole lot of people involved in that. But the fact that you guys trusted us enough to move forward with so little involvement means more to me than you guys will ever, ever know. And I hope we did you proud. And um, I hope for years to come, that will be the center of this community and a, and a gathering place that people are gonna enjoy for, for years to come. So as I look around this table here, there's not very many good golfers. So um, I hope that you uh, will think of me when you need a fourth. If you need somebody good from the red tees, I'm, I'm always here. And uh, don't be strangers, you've got, my, you've got my number. So I love you, thank you very much. Where this community gets a lot of national recognition and in almost everything uh, quality of life is mentioned and recreations at the absolute core of that. So you've had a nationwide impact. So thank you very much. We owe you a debt of gratitude. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion by Councilman Clue. Mr. Stubbe. Not yet. We'll, we'll take a break and then do that. Mayor. That's like third meeting in a row. <laughs> we remove number eight, please. Yeah. Administrator's report, please. Thanks again for that. <laughs> uh, just a few things. As Mayor Black has already mentioned, Governor Ricketts has signed a new executive order to allow virtual meetings to commence again now through January 31st, 2021. We will go back to virtual meetings starting at the next regular city council meeting, which is December 15th. Like last time, we will still have the council chambers open to the public. And those of you council members that want to come here to log, to log into Zoom are more than welcome to do so. The special meetings to discuss Ordinance 1911 that are scheduled for 7 p.m. tomorrow and Thursday night will still occur in person here at City Hall. A big thanks to Tony and the Parks and Facilities Department for another magical winter wonderland. This year was especially important and the event truly provided some light during this dark time. Just one of the many things that makes Papillion feel like home. City staff is working with the state to complete the agreement for the relinquishment of Highway 85 and to have the agreement on the December 15th council agenda for consideration of approval. A part of the agreement includes allowing the city to make modifications to the 84th Street corridor, which if you remember, we weren't previously allowed to do since it was a state highway. And finally, the bid opening for the City Hall renovation project is December 11th. Provided that there are qualified bidders and the bids come within our budget range, the contract to award the project will be on the December 15th agenda, along with the contract for the leasing of another space for a temporary City Hall office. That's all I had, thank you. Thank you very much. We've got a motion to approve the consent. Do we have a second? Second by Councilman Ingberg. We'll poll item eight. Um, do we have any proponents or opponents on the consent agenda? See none, any council discussion? Please vote on everything except C8. Council member Gaines, can you unmute to vote please? A vote yes. Eight yes, zero nays. Motion passes, item C8. Resolution R20-0228, a resolution to encourage the use of mitigation strategies related to COVID-19. Um, just real quick for the public and then I'll call for the motion. The, the motion. Um, this is just a statement of uh, support to encourage people to follow all the um, normal recommendations of COVID. Um, the other cities I believe are doing it, Bellevue's doing it, that's kind of where it was initiated and they just wanted to show a unified support of the health department in encouraging the recommendations. So this is not mandates, this is uh, encouraging recommend, uh, following the recommended strategies. So is there a motion? Motion. Motion by Councilman Sunday. Second by Councilman Jaworski. Do we have any proponents or opponents on the resolution? Yes. And if you'd state your name for the record. And this is not mask mandates. Understood. Yeah. yeah. My name is Edward Weniger. Uh, I live in Wall uh, Creek. I just wanted to make the obvious statement that this is sufficient and constitutional. And this seems to be a 
reasonable measure to take for COVID-19 as compared to uh, uh, the articles we're gonna hear coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Any other proponents or opponents? Any council discussion? Mr. Sunday. Your Honor, I wanted to separate this uh, because I, I agree with the last speaker. I think it does provide a, a viable alternative to the heavy, what I view as a heavy handed mask mandate uh, when this something like this is, is more of a partnership with our citizens and our businesses, less heavy handed, less insulting to our citizens. So I support this and I will not be supporting the mandate. Thank you. Any other discussion? Please vote. Vote yes, Mayor. Eight yeas, zero nays. Motion passes. Item D1, ordinance 1909, an ordinance to approve the issuance of building refunding bonds, public works and parks maintenance facility project, series 2021 of the Municipal Facilities Corporation with principal not to exceed $4.2 million. Um, staff is recommending a waiver of second and the third. Is there a council member that will introduce? Introduced by Councilman Ingberg. Is there a motion to waive the second and third readings? Motion by Councilman Ingberg, second by Councilman Stubbe. This does take a super majority. It's very typical on our uh, bond request to do that. Uh, do we have any proponents or opponents? Any council discussion? Mr. Ingberg. Uh, just, just for a point of reference for those of you that aren't on the municipal uh, facilities committee we met prior to the council meeting tonight uh, with Mr. Leffler from Sandler Piper, Piper Sandler uh, who went over this and as all of you remember when it comes time to do the uh, bonding uh, particularly when we do the refinancing uh, which saves the taxpayers money but it does not lengthen the length of the and doesn't lengthen or increase the cost of the bond at all actually saving money we'd like to waive the second third reading so we can lock it the interest rate in today, uh, which helps them move the bonds. Thank you. Any other council discussion? Please vote on the motion to waive. Vote yes, Mayor. Seven yeas, one nay by Sunday. Motion passes, so we can move on to the motion to approve ordinance 1909. Is there a motion? Motion by Councilman Stubbe, second by Councilman Jaworski. Any council discussion? Please vote. Councilman Gaines votes yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. Motion passes. Item D2, Ordinance 1910, an ordinance to approve the issuance of refunding bonds, Eagle Hills Golf Course Project Series 2021 of the Municipal Facilities Corporation with principal not to exceed $2 million. Is there a council member that will introduce? Introduced by Councilman Glover. Again, it's a bond, so typical is staff is recommending the waiver of second and third. Is there a motion? Motion by Councilman Kluke, second by Councilman Jaworski. Any proponents or opponents? Any council discussion? Please vote. <laughs> vote yes. Seven yeas, one nay by Sunday. Motion to waive passes. So is there a motion to approve ordinance 1910? Motion by Councilman Glover, second by Councilman Jaworski. Any discussion on this? Please vote. Councilman Gaines votes yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. Thank you for both of those uh, with the interest rate environment that saves us uh, significant interest um, from what we originally had. Item D3, ordinance 1911. An ordinance to amend Papillion Municipal Code Chapter 125 entitled Health and Sanitation to add new sections 125.11 through 125.23 to enact requirements for the wearing of facial coverings under certain circumstances so as to abate the COVID-19 pandemic and to provide for an effective date. Is there a council member that will introduce? Council, uh, Count, Councilman Jaworski introduces. Uh, just for public education, then I'll jump to Mr. Mumgard. <clears throat> um, a couple of weeks ago, the Public Safety Committee of the Council, which is a subset of the Council, just met to get a COVID update, and it was out of that committee meeting that a recommendation was made to call the Board of Health. 
Uh, that was on a 3-1 vote. It was not unanimous, but it was a majority. Um, so then based on that, the Board of Health me uh, was called. Um, first time the Board of Health has met, I think in 15 years. Um, but uh, they met last week and uh, got an update. And then it was the Board of Health that made the recommendation for a mask mandate. Um, some of the other cities around us did it at the same time. They actually then immediately went to council with an emergency. Uh, we did not do that. We waited for the regular council meeting to do the introduction. Uh, but the Board of Health did recommend a waiver of second and third, which we're not recommending on the agenda, but because of their sense of urgency, that's why we have a public hearing tomorrow and then a vote scheduled for Thursday. Um, so we're not waiving the second and third like they wanted, but we are expediting the process a little bit. But each of those council meetings were published to the public as we normally would. Um, and so the public hearing is scheduled for tomorrow. Um, Mr. Mumgard. Uh, yes, I, I was given the circumstances that uh, we're having just an introduction tonight, but yet I realize that we have, it's been a matter of some discussion and controversy within the city, within the city and we have people here tonight. So I would make a motion to open the public hearing tonight and receive public comment both tonight and on second reading tomorrow night. Second. Let me, so we have a motion in a second, but let me just clarify and make, make sure my interpretation is correct from the city attorney, because this is unusual what we're doing, but I think it's allowed. Um, I'm not aware of other times that we have actually uh, had the public hearing at the introduction of the first reading, unless we did the waiver. Um, so I think it is unusual from that aspect, but I believe it's allowed. Um, with the first, second, and third reading of ordinances, uh, the first reading is published as an introduction. So the public expectation is no hearing tonight from what we uh, officially publish. Um, the second reading intent is a public hearing. So that's the public's chance to speak. And the state law and, and city ordinance, I believe, the intent is everybody gets one chance to speak during that three-step process. We actually go one step further. Um, because on the third reading with council discussion, we actually call for proponents and opponents. So there's almost a second bite at the apple for discussion. So if we do open it tonight, that it, that theoretically could create a third chance. But what I believe the intent would be, uh, you do have a right to make the motion. Council member has a right to make the motion to open the public hearing, but it is treated as the public hearing. So if somebody does, if we open it tonight, somebody speaks tonight, Again, our practice is during public hearings, speak, people speak one time. So speaking tonight, they would not speak tomorrow. Um, I believe that would be the right interpretation. Is that correct? Yes, that's under our city ordinance. Um, individuals are allowed to speak at uh, one time and they're not, they're, there's not an entitlement to be allowed to speak at a subsequent meeting on the same issue. Okay, so if we do open the public hearing tonight, we're adding, we're, we're basically opening the public hearing early and then we'll in effect continue it tomorrow. So we have a motion by Mumgard. Second was by Sunday. Any council discussion? Yes, Mr. I, Mr. I will just explain my purpose here is to, I understand it's unusual, but my purpose here is to allow the people that are here tonight and have views to make a choice. They can talk tonight or they can talk tomorrow night. Um, but you know, we're going to, we want to listen to you and we don't want it in unduly inconvenience you. So if you're here tonight, I think it's fair that we take a few minutes and we listen to the citizens that are here. That's why I've made that motion. Um, Mr. Mr. Stubbe. As a proponent or as an opponent. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sunday. Yes, uh, I agree largely with what, what, what Mr. Councilman Mumgard just said. Um, I know a lot of people came here not sure whether we were going to go ahead with a vote tonight. And, and I don't know that anybody knew because somebody could still make the motion now if they wanted to. And if there's enough votes, it could go forward tonight. So people came here out of an abundance of caution, not knowing. I think we should respect that and let them speak tonight if they so choose, or if they want to come back tomorrow night instead, that's their choice too. Thank you. Any other council discussion? Mr. Ingberg. Uh, just to clarify for the people sitting out there too, because 
Uh, they may not be here tomorrow night for the public hearing. It's my understanding that uh, uh, comments or emails that council people or, or the mayor's office or the city in particular have received will be part of the public record um, uh, automatically. Um, and if as, long you have, as, as long as the city clerk's aware of them, any that yeah. I've, any that come in through the mayor's hotline are part of it. Any that I've been copied on uh, get forwarded. Any come that come directly get part. Because there are a few requests in our emails, and uh, I just wanted to make notice to the people here tonight, or maybe watching the uh, delayed broadcast of it, that um, as long as council gets it to the the city clerk, it'll become part of, of the public record. I gave. Uh, Ms. Brown, uh, a um, um, email I received about six o'clock this evening before the our other meeting started. Um, there was an important one, so uh, I just wanted to clarify that. That is correct. So we have a motion and a second. We've had council discussion to open the public hearing tonight in addition to tomorrow's published one. Please vote. Gaines votes yes. Eight, eight, zero, nine, eight. Motion passes, so I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. I'm going to call for proponents first, and then I'll call for opponents. And with council, with uh, public hearing, um, individuals are given five minutes um, to speak. And I'll kind of give you a two-minute warning and about a 30-second more uh, warning so you can go ahead and wrap up. Do we have any proponents? Any opponents? And when you come up, if you'd state your name for the record and your address, uh, show your papillion resident. Thank you. I'm Lou Sloger. I pastor Grace Baptist Church. My home address is 103, 1003 Crest Road here in Papillion. Um, I have a little brochure I'd like to submit for the record about masks. And I, I, I also would just like to say that um, I've done three funerals this year. And the, the response, the governmental response to this virus, I believe, is unconstitutional. More importantly, I believe it's inhumane. And most importantly, I believe it's ungodly. When I'm not allowed to, to visit a hospital and pray with somebody who's dying, when people aren't allowed to hug their loved ones goodbye, I think everybody should ask themselves, where do we draw the line that we stop? You guys wanna take another step. Two weeks to flatten the curve, what week are we in? 15 days to flatten the curve. How many days have we been doing this? It's a virus. We get sick, we die. It happens to everybody sooner or later. But what we're doing, suicide rates are up. Opiate uh, overdoses are up. Divorce is up. Unemployment is up. The damage is being done by our response to this virus. God only knows how bad it really is. And I am begging you, I'm begging you to consider if we're not making things worse by our experts and we think we know better than God and we can stop something that we can't even see. So I just like to, anybody want one of these? I'll give you one, I got seven of them. And that's really all I have to say. I, I just think anybody who's being honest has to admit the cure has been worse than the disease. And there's just no doubt about that. And I'm begging you, stop. And let this be enough. Thank you. Next. Any other opponent? Yes, sir. And just for as he's coming up, just let people know, we know there's some outside of the room and maybe downstairs that want to speak as well. And we'll coordinate them to come up as well. So everybody have that opportunity. Go ahead, sir. My name is Michael Tiedemann. I live at 101 Somerset Drive, Napoleon, Nebraska. Council members and mayor. First and foremost, I am completely against the city of Papillion adopting a mask mandate. COVID-19 is showing approximately a 99.98% survival rate for the 20 to 49 year age group. Even in the affected age group, 70 years and older has a survival rate of approximately 94.6%. The median age of a Papillion resident is 36.4 years old, putting a majority of the city's population in the 99.98% survival rate. Passing an ordinance that forces everyone to wear a mask is com a complete overreaction to the small mortality of this virus. As citizens have get endured the government, or as citizens we have endured the government forcing churches and businesses to close, some of them forever. 
We have had our travel restricted. We have been forced to quarantine. Some, of, some areas of the country, we are seeing the police setting up checkpoints, not allowing people to enter their jurisdiction without having a negative test result. In other areas, we see the government setting up hotlines and encouraging neighbors to rat out each other. Almost every place we see this happening, and it started with a mask mandate. It is because of this, I don't trust that you, that if you pass a mask mandate, it will stop there. The other places in this country are illustrating that this is a power grab being concealed in the guise of public safety for the greater good. We don't have to look too far back in history to find another government that suspended personal liberty for the greater good. That government was led by Adolf Hitler, and we all know how that turned out. Another example of a group that mandated face coverings was the Taliban. They mandated the women must cover their face. This was done to subjugate the women. Are you passing this ordinance to subjugate us? I know what is best for my health. It shows a great deal of hubris for you to sit there and tell me what you, that you know what is best for me. Each and every person here has the right to wear a mask or face covering if they want to. Should I not be afforded the same right if I choose not to? Once again, I am vehemently against a mandate in any form, and I will not comply with a mandate if you pass one. Benjamin Franklin once said, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Thank you. Thank you. And I would ask for decorum. There's no applause, no comments during people's uh, comments. And if you have spoken, you have no other business, we, I'm not requiring you to leave. I'm asking if you would, um, that'll free up a seat for somebody else to come in. It's not a mandate to leave, but more of a courtesy. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any other opponents? Say opponents. Opponents. Okay. And then we'll do neutral in case yeah. somebody fits that. Go my ahead. name, my name is Ken Hall. I'm a, I live here in Omaha, Nebraska, at one four six zero six Cumming Street. I uh, work for a public adjusting firm. I'm uh, the technical expert for one of the largest public adjusting firms in the country. I'm a licensed PA in Nebraska and Iowa. My job is to go out and accumulate the evidence when there's storm damage. Uh, to determine what the cause of was and so forth. So, you know, I'm, I'm a tech guy. I've got 40 years construction background, developed roofing materials, manufactured roofing materials and so forth. Uh, you probably, you might remember me from 2004. I was a guy on three stations embarrassing Omaha City Council for taking the ice barrier out of the code in 2004 after I pressured them to enforce the ice barrier for new construction in 2003. And Hearthstone went in and whined and cried and got him to delete the code. You know, what I do is I go out and I find evidence that, that engineers and, and adjusters are ignoring, usually deliberately, when they're hired by the carrier and try, trying to intimidate people. So I know how easy it is to manipulate data and testing, especially testing that's done on a very limited scale that doesn't, you know, anywhere come close to replicating real life. And I see the same thing happening here today. I've been following this since January. I was listening to alternative news. I was prepping, I was prepping my family back in January and February because we, we thought the death rate was gonna be 10%. So we were buying elderberry syrup and, and you know, stocking up on all kinds of things, vitamin A, vitamin D, zinc. Because I listened to probably, well, 75 doctors from all over the country and some of them represent groups of doctors. One, Dr. Graves down in Kansas City represents a group of 35,000 doctors that got together six years ago to try to bring down the price of prescription drugs for their customers. And they've been sharing intel on COVID-19 since it started. And they've been censored completely. Their careers are being threatened because they're not playing along with the CDC who can't make up their mind whether it's transfer human to human or not. Remember, they said it wasn't. And don't wear a mask but now you gotta wear a mask. You know, anybody that's intellectually honest realizes this is a scam, not the virus, but the way that we've dealt with it. Now the UN said there's gonna be over 300,000 people or 300 million people starved to death this year because of the shutdown in food production and food distribution. So much for saving lives, but I guess those are mostly brown people, right? Around the world. This is not about public health, this is about control. Right now, we've got so much tension in this country, Two minutes. it's about to explode. 
We need to reduce that tension. The last thing we need is to put our public servants in harm's way by trying to you know, violate people's civil rights, which by the way, even passing that legislation would be a felony, class four felony, Title 18 U.S. Code 241 and 242. The deprivation of, deprivation of rights under the color of law, ordinance, or regulation. It was passed during the civil rights movement. Remember, Jim Crow laws, segregation. They apply just as much today about this and our religious freedom, because for me, this is a religious exercise. I have a God. Nobody in this room qualifies to be my God. And the, my God doesn't take kindly to people playing God with our lives. So I've been all over the country. I wrote the parody this being used for the Sanctuary County movement in the East Coast right now with the One Civil, minute. Virginia Civil Defense League. You know, I sang the opening song at the rally. I talked to probably half a dozen officers in the state Capitol Police and the state patrol while I was there, the state police. Right now, they're getting ready to arrest anybody in 85 of those counties that come into their counties to try to enforce the legislation that the legislatures of the state keep you know, passing. People are standing up. There's over 20 million background checks for firearm purchases alone every year, and there has been for the last decade. Those people seconds. are preparing to defend themselves. We need to reduce the tension, not add to it. We're there, there are effective and safe treatments all over the place, and we need to get doctors like Dr. Graves up here to, to and educate the people because information and education is power. Give them the power to take care of themselves. Don't try to be their mom and their papa, and certainly don't play God with their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, and again, if you, uh, once you've spoken, if you would uh, leave, we do have a number of people that want to come in and we want to respect the social distancing. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Lorraine Renante, 1108 Park Drive, Papillion. <clears throat> I'm down to three and a half minutes, I think. Okay. Mask as a broad policy is questionable despite the constitutionality of a mandate. In a lab, it's been shown to possibly mitigate some of the droplets by the wearer in a controlled environment. But what happens when the wearer touches their mask? Then what? They say it's settled science. When you spend all day touching your mask, putting it in your pocket, dropping it on the floor and reusing it the next day, as many people do, it is a lot less effective. How many people have worn the same mask twice, three times? A mask mandate infringes on individual freedoms, the gross overstepping of federal, state, and local governments from shutdowns, and mask mandates is about control to see how far they can push. I will not accept this as the new normal. Private businesses can mandate whatever they want. Folks can choose to shop there or not if there is a mask mandate. I'm not saying don't wear a mask. Wear one if you want. I'm saying that the government does not have the moral authority or right to mandate a mask ordinance for individual citizens. We need to have a real debate on the use of masks. We have more shutdowns and mask mandates than ever in the US and yet the infection rate continues to rise. Why do you think that is? The obvious is that masks and shutdowns do not work. These masks are being worn like a talisman. People should have the liberty to take those precautions if they want. I care about people and I want them to be safe, but I also care about our freedoms and that they are never trampled on for the greater good. New York City shut down schools, but bars can remain open until 10 p.m. I guess the virus is only contagious after 10.01 p.m. How about California when Governor Gavin Newsom showed up at an indoor dining restaurant with 12 or more people? Just a week before, he begged Californians to cancel their Thanksgiving plans. The people with the most up-to-date information on the virus are continually caught violating their own rules, and that makes me skeptical. People will deflect to our power-hungry overlords, but I'm not buying it. We just can't issue mandates out of fear as a knee-jerk reaction to do something, anything so that you all will feel better and say, we did something. Officials are trying to control something they cannot control. Why now? Is it because there is a group in Lincoln that is putting pressure on cities outside of Omaha? What about the big tech companies that are here in Papillion? Are they putting pressure on the officials too? 
Just over this past weekend, Dr. Fauci has again changed his position on things. Now he is saying that we should close the bars and open the schools. He said that we've always known about the data for schools for months. Two minutes. We have children in this country languishing at home, isolated and afraid. They are behind in education, lost their prom, lost their jobs. What is happening here? Basically, Dr. Fauci lied about children and the media spread the lie. The children are locked down because adults are afraid. What else are they not telling us? There are studies that indicate continually wearing a cloth mask actually causes infections. Just wait for the lawsuits to start. There currently is one lawsuit in Tulsa, Oklahoma involving their city. I suspect once the floodgates are open and the lawsuits, things will dramatically shift. The loss of liberty is not sudden. It is a creeping gradualism. Managing a public health situation is not about one variable. It is about a combination of medical, economic, social, and political issues. It is, per, it is a perplexing question to reduce something so emotional to, I am good and you are bad argument. One minute. If you want to wear a mask for whatever reason, wear a mask, but you're ignoring the grave implication of mask mandates to our exceptional freedoms as Americans. And then someone else beat me to the punchline, but I'll say it anyhow. So I will leave you with this quote by Benjamin Franklin, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Thank you Thank very you. much. Any other opponents? Yes, sir. If I, <clears throat> excuse me, if I could hand these to Ms. Brown to yes. pass out to the council yeah. members. And if you'd state your name for the record. My name is Tim Hall, uh, 901 Michael Drive. I'd like to thank the city council for the opportunity to express my concerns this evening regarding the pending decision as to whether to impose a mask mandate on the citizens of Papillion. Let me begin by stating that I and surely every person in this chamber wants the pandemic to end. Nobody wants a family member or a neighbor to die from this pandemic. Of equal importance though, I do not want new laws to be imposed that will not produce the desired effect. Professionally, I've been assessing plans and operations and their effectiveness for nearly the past decade. To do this, what we must do is leave a motion at the door and look at the cold hard facts of the issue. I bring up a motion because when we are scared or desperately want a, a solution we often look past data that challenges our desired outcomes. We have the unique ability to examine whether the mask mandates work or not with several close to home examples. Let's just look to Omaha and Lincoln to see how their mask mandates, which have been in effect for three plus months, have worked compared to Sarpy County, which up to now has had no mask mandates. To make an apples to apples comparison of whether mask mandates decrease the spread of virus throughout the greater population, I chose to look at instances of new cases per 100,000 people. Now the first chart that I passed out since July, you'll see when their mask mandate went into effect, Lancaster County has shown a steady increase in cases from less than 20 per day to 84 per day as of the latest reporting. Since August 12th, when Douglas County's mask mandate was enacted, they have shown a steady increase from 20 per day to 94 and a half. The final chart shows Papillion, so let's take a look at that one, or uh, Sarpy County actually. Since August, Sarpy County had anywhere from 10 to 25 cases per day and we have seen a steady increase to 85.3 per day. Those are identical, essentially, all three examples. And from that data from Omaha and Lincoln, it shows that mask mandates do not have any measurable effect in reducing the spread of the virus throughout the greater population. For months, we have read daily stories in the Omaha World Herald 
which appear intended to scare people into demanding city and even statewide mask mandates. We, you have even uh, in your proposal, you have attached three of these scare pieces in your references attempting to justify this ordinance. But based on the data from Omaha and Lincoln, a mask mandate for Papillion would merely be symbolic to appease the media induced panic. So I'm here tonight to implore the city council to step back, slow down and consider this issue with logic and not emotion. It is yours and my individual responsibility to make personal health decisions that we deem are appropriate for ourselves and our family. If wearing a mask makes you feel safer, then by all means wear one. Double up on them if you feel that that's what's best for you and your family. These personal actions do not require the force of law. Please do not impose ineffective mandates upon your neighbors just so you can feel good about doing something. Fear or panic or a desire to just do something is not a good basis on which to enact the law. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Do we have any other opponents? Welcome. And if you'd repeat your name for the record. Yeah, my name's Edward uh, Winninger. I live in Walnut Creek. Do you know that I respect you and think most residents of play and appreciate all you've done for our economy in town? In my limited purview, you're probably ranked as one of the greatest mayors in America, and I can almost guarantee you your stalwart dedication to the freedom we've enjoyed in Sarpy, as opposed to Douglas, has dramatically benefited our businesses and economies. Our economy. Here are my questions about Proposal 1911. If it looks like a fish and smells like a fish, it must be fishy. I understand your position that you've gone slower than neighboring counties. Why is this still being done in a very short window of time? Why is a third reading not recommended or a third night of public hearing to allow the maximum number of citizens to speak? Why is the contents of the resolution when you know it's going to be controversial not more easily accessible online? Why is this all transpiring right after you've all been reelected? Our media overlords want us to wear masks. The censorious tech oligarchs in Silicon Valley want us to wear a mask. Justin Wayne and the Democrats want us to wear a mask, but none of them rule over us. The, the Papillion City Council doesn't rule over us. You, the city council members, govern at the will of we the people. And I will be sure to remind everybody about this tra travesty if it passes come next election. We are not a socialist country, state, county, or city. If someone is concerned about getting sick, they should stay home. They are free to not go out and shop. They are not con you are not constitutionally empowered to force me to wear a mask. You, the city council, cannot stop citizens from getting sick. You are not God. People die. Life is full of risk. That risk is what makes America great. Government reliance and imposing these draconian laws on healthy people is un-American. What happens if nothing changes with COVID statistics and hospital beds? Will this all have been a waste and unnecessary infringement on our rights? What form is the next infringement going to take? What will the experts coerce you into doing next time around? At what point do you choose to exercise restraint and not cave to public pressure? There's plenty of proof from other counties that masks don't work. Other, as was just mentioned, our experts cannot make up their mind about masks and many other aspects of this virus. One month, there's one standard and edict, then the next month, it's something different. We have the constitution as a basis for our laws and to protect our rights as Americans. Tell me where it says that you have the authority to restrict my movement as an individual if I don't put a diaper on my face. Any city council member who swore an oath to uphold and defend the constitution as part of their public service or forsaking that oath by voting yes. I'm sure it's hard. It may mean you lose your council seat by doing the right thing. There's a, probably a lot of public pressure and peer pressure. Our founding fathers faced death and sacrifice as well. But I pray you will have the courage of your convictions and make the right decision by voting no. Thank you. Any other opponents? Hi, my name's Jacqueline Nelson and I live at 803 North Polk Street here in Papillion. My family and I are proud to have called this area home for over 16 years as we've been blessed to have been sta stationed at Offit since 2004. I'm very proud of my new hometown and I lovingly refer to it as Mayberry to my out-of-state family. However, it saddens me that a mask mandate is even on the table. I'm not gonna stand up here and argue over the validity of masks, one study versus another, one version of data compared to another, or even personal opinions as to whether they work or not, all of that is irrelevant. 
It doesn't matter if masks could completely eradicate the virus from the face of this planet. The fact remains government has absolutely no right to mandate we wear one. It isn't the government's job to keep me healthy. That's my job. The government's job is to protect our freedoms and liberty. It is indeed treacherous ground we trod when we allow our government, no matter on what level, to start mandating we wear a particular item or not. Shall I bring up the Star of David worn by the Jews, the hijab or the burqa in the Middle East, or the standardized clothing, clothing of the Chinese in the 1940s? Far reached, you might say? I'm sure the same thing was said of those items. Something, everything has to start somewhere. It's just a mask. No, it's a symbol of oppression, standardization, dehumanization, and compliance. Have you stood in the middle of Target lately and just listened? Have you noticed that there's almost no conversation, no more whiny toddlers, no more giggly children, no more neighbors trying to quickly grab a loaf of bread while still on the phone carrying on a conversation? It is complete silence. The human factor is all but gone. The worst part of this mess, there's no deadline. No date to work toward, no countdown. As a military wife, I've co co collectively spent years without my husband. I have four kids six years apart and the vast majority of his deployments were taking place when they were little. It sort of felt like oppression. We quickly learned the importance of a countdown. I'd buy calendars and we would count down the days until it was over. When the endless days would get to me, it was looking at how far we had come that kept me going and knowing that an end indeed was in sight that brought me hope. We have no end in sight. It started as two weeks to flatten the curve, six weeks to slow the spread. Now we're entering the ninth month and we still don't have an end date. Furthermore, how do you plan to enforce the mandate? Are we really gonna turn our police into the mask patrol? What would that really help in this already turbulent time that they're facing as police officers? How would that show the community that they are indeed public service, not the new Gestapo? Is that really the best use of the city's resources? What about all the other little towns that are adopting a mask mandate? Well, I'm sure y'all all heard when you were little, if somebody jumped off a bridge, would you jump? Two minutes. So in closing, I implore each of you to consider if some questionable method of slowing down this virus is indeed worth stripping your community of their humanness, their liberty, and their freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? I know some new people have come in. Are there any proponents? I'll do that real quick. Okay, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. That's what that's fine. Go ahead. My name is Roy Hurd. I live at 1102 Hickory Hill Road. Um, I just, everything good has been said already. I just want to publicly stand up here with the rest of these people and say I'm against this. And as one person said, every one of you, I assume, is took a oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I have taken that oath myself many, many times, being active duty military for 21 years. I take that oath seriously. I would hope that each and every one of you would do the same when it comes to this law or a curfew law or whatever law it has to be, you have to bring it up against the Constitution. Whether it be this, the US Constitution, the Nebraska Constitution and our own Constitution, if we have one here in Papillion, that has to be the backdrop for everything you guys do. And with that, thank you for your time and I'll let somebody else talk now. Thank you very much. Next, I'll stop doing proponents and opponents because people keep coming in, we'll just do next. Hello, my name is William Hooper. I'm a resident here of uh, Papillion. And uh, I'm here just primarily to talk a little bit about the mask itself. Um, I've worked for the past 30 years in the healthcare field. Uh, I was in the United States Air Force. Um, I was in there during H1N1. And uh, within uh, the dental career field where I worked, we would wear uh, many years ago, these little blue cup-like masks similar to what you see contractors wear uh, that are like replacing insulation in homes. And those masks work well for that, but not so much for the uh, virons that are actually involved in a virus. Back in 2009, when H1N1 came out, they actually took those masks away and tried to get us a, a better almost N95 type masks to wear at that time, knowing that 
that was not a full safe mechanism. I mean, uh, when you see people that work in medical laboratories with viruses, they don't just walk in with a mask. I mean, the, a mask mandate might make some people feel better, but it's really not going to do anything for their safety. And uh, that's, that's the one thing I wanna bring out. Another thing is just a little tidbit information about N95 mask. Um, the N95 mask is called an N95 mask because that mask itself, unless it is sealed to the face, is less than 95% effective on viruses itself. That's one of the reasons why in hospitals they, they would have the face shield down with the mask up underneath it. Um, and so um, this is a terrible thing that's happened to America, um, but it, this is a virus, it's a survivable virus. And uh, I have had a family member in Minnesota, an 80 year old um, um, uncle to my wife uh, passed away. He had underlying conditions. I myself am a colorectal cancer survivor. I mean, I'm not going to live in fear because of a virus, especially knowing that if I wear a mask, it's not doing anything. So, you know, these are just some words I'd like you to kind of take to heart. Um, we have a great town here. Uh, and uh, I, I would just, you know, I want to see smiling faces if at all possible. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Feel free to jump in <laughs> at any time. It's coming Thanks. to the rescue. All right, appreciate that. There we go. If you'd state your name for the record as well. Sure, it's Reagan Simons. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address you this evening. Whenever there is a risk, there should be a choice. The fact is masks do not work to stop or even slow the virus. Look at Omaha numbers. Now UNMC and toxicologist Adi Poor will tell you some ridiculous excuse or hypothesis as to why they think the numbers have gone up since implementing a mask mandate, but that's fake news, not based on verifiable data. What we know now is we were told by the made up graph of Dr. Khan presented to the Omaha City Council that without mask numbers would go up. Well, guess what? The numbers went up, not down. It's obvious now that we've been lied to. What would UNMC, why would UNMC lie? Well, I can only speculate, but my guess is 379,000 per COVID patient via the CARES Act can have an opinion on how a hospital does business. The fact is you need to look past a lab coat and look at the whole picture, but I digress. We're not really talking about if masks work or if they don't work, or the fact that according to the World Health Organization, homemade masks provide somewhere between zero and 26% filtration of large particles as shown in this graph. Um, we're not talking about um, the fact that masks have real physical and emotional side effects on perfectly healthy little kids who are forced to wear them seven to 10 hours per day, or how our children are bearing the brunt of the restrictions, even though they're not the ones dying or even getting sick from a virus with a 99% recovery rate. We're not talking about how unethical it is for a doctor or board of health to force healthy people to wear a mask that could make them sick, yet they refuse to tell them about the importance of vitamin D, sunshine, fresh air, and a healthy diet. We're not talking about the psychological impact of telling children they're dirty, and they have the potential to kill grandma or their school teacher with a single touch. Or that if you look, if you took the time to swab their mask after a school day, you would see a whole host of disgusting things on the inside of their mask, sitting on their precious lips, shown here in this picture. This is swabs that were taken from my son's mask after school one day from the inside of their mask. And I was told by a lab tech that there's staff, there's E. coli, there's a whole host of things on their mask. No, what we're talking about today is making it illegal for free citizens to breathe fresh air. We don't need the government to micromanage or threaten citizens. That's not why you were elected. 
Don't just follow along with the corrupt city council and mayors of other cities and towns are doing. Most people will wear a mask without government overreach. Many people can't or should not ever wear a mask, but still need to be able to move about in a free society. Don't be fooled. This is not about health or public safety. If this were about health, you would outlaw the real killers of your constituents, smoking, drinking, donuts. <laughs> Allow the children and citizens of Papillion to breathe the fresh air God gave us and take a stand tonight or in a couple of days. There's still a lot of confusion about what you guys are doing. Um, vote no against the insanity. What I've seen time and time again at these city council meetings and board of health meetings, and I've been to plenty of them, is the failure of public officials to exercise logic or ask the right questions. If masks work, why did my office close? Because we had five people in the office who wore masks and got COVID. If masks work, why do the numbers go up? What is on the mask at the end of the day? If masks work, then why have my parents who have been confined to a nursing home due to health reasons been separated from each other and from us for the last nine months? Yet my dad, 72 years old, still got COVID. If masks work and everybody's doing the right PPE, how did that happen? One minute. There are 25 or so people on the first floor and you all won't let them in. Why is that? Don't just pass this because of Omaha did. Businesses in Omaha are in the tank. Three restaurants in my very neighborhood just recently closed because people don't want to go out and deal with the mask thing because of all the COVID things. Whenever there is a risk, there should be a choice. And you need to open up the rest of this space for the people downstairs. It makes no sense to have 25 or 30 of us congregating in that tiny space on the first floor because COVID or social distancing. Why won't you let us in? Why are you having the police keep us downstairs? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Who, do, who can hand these two to? Next. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Steve Packard and uh, I'm, a resident, I'm a resident of Omaha. Um, you heard from my friend earlier, his name's Ken Hall. Uh, Ken and I are both, we like to think of ourselves as Second Amendment constitutionalist types. We've been doing this for eight years and I mean, just all kinds of activism and, and uh, uh, lobbying. But anyhow, I, um, I've really been enjoying what I've been hearing from everyone here. These are very consistent. You've seen a lot of ladies out here. There are a lot of them are mothers and they're very good people. I love that I'm seeing the eyes and the ears which direction is north? <laughs> Thank you. I have to tell you, I was a resident of Omaha for 35 years and uh, I really like that there's competition because um, I was born and raised there and uh, I didn't ask much. I've never asked a favor of anyone in the city government in Omaha until last year. Uh, and, uh, and it started this year with all this COVID and I have to tell you guys, um, it's, it's pretty bad up there. I don't mind just speaking and telling people how I see things. I, I, try, I try to be straight, I try to be direct, I try to be authentic, whatever. But, um, you know, this is, this is my opinion, uh, that uh, that city council, that municipality up there has treated me and all these others like something they left in the toilet. It's pretty disturbing to me, but I'm not, uh, I don't mean to vent at you guys, you know, um, like I said, I love what I'm seeing and uh, life is hard in 2020, no matter who you are or what you're doing. You might ask, why are Second Amendment, why are Patriot guys up here, you know, why are all these veterans coming to you telling you, but they're veterans and talk about masks. Um, this has become about more than the mask. And I, again, I like it. You guys are, are listening and you're engaging and you're hearing, just let yourself learn and let yourself stand up. This is about the future, right? There are basically good paths and there are basically bad paths. Don't be fooled by Omaha. <laughs> 35 year resident, born and raised there. Don't be fooled by those guys. Don't be fooled by those guys. They've made their choices. They've sold where they need to sell. <clears throat> this is about the future. There are gonna be more choices coming up. 
we already know how 2021 is being set up. 2020 was tough. People can't wait for it to be over. I can't fear 2021 enough. Two minutes. So I'm encouraging you guys to really listen to what's being said and really hear. And if you want Papillion to be a great place and you want those people in Omaha <laughs> who want to annex everything in the county, if they would, and maybe they're going to go south. If you're really proud of this place and what you've built and you need to know what your future is, listen up here and think about what's coming up. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next. Yeah. And if you'd state your name for the record. Gabriel Schleter. Uh, first, I want to thank you guys for your, oh gosh, um, just for your work in leadership in 2020 to balance like empathy and truth and um, personal values with your government roles, I can imagine has been at best exhausting. So first, I just want to thank you guys um, for your work in all this. Um, I read through the mandate and there are some things that I wanted to bring to your attention and ask questions about. I don't know if you guys have a copy of it in front of you. Um, but uh, section 125, 11, number one, um, the novel coronavirus has impacted and continues to dramatically impact the citizens of Papillion. Um, I think it would be wise to define the word dramatic when you are writing this mandate out, maybe make a change there. What is dramatic? That's very subjective. Is it dramatic to you? Is it dramatic to you? What is that? Um, let's be specific when we're writing this. Um, the exposure to COVID, this is number two, uh, presents a risk of death or serious long-term disability. Um, currently, the risk of death is 0.48 in Sarpy and Cass counties, 0.48%. Um, so that risk of death, it might be wise to look and compare that to other risks of death that are also in um, Papillion. Um, the, like for, I mean, for example, other health concerns, accidents, anything else that's a risk of death, you might wanna compare those percents before moving forward with um, number two. Uh, going down to number four, the manner in which the spread of COVID-19 has occurred creates unacceptable risk. Again, what is the manner, as it's saying, the manner in which the spread is that person to person? Is that just being out in public? What is this manner? Um, and let's be specific also with unacceptable, right? So right now you're saying unacceptable risk is 0 0.0048. Um, is that true of everything? Or is this just one area that you guys think is unacceptable as opposed to um, other, again, um, other ways that are, now let's see. Number six, um, the spread and treatment ha has caused serious and dangerous shortage of medical beds. Um, again, that is a very broad sentence. Is that all specific to COVID or is it end of year people trying to get in their insurance, which many medical professionals are talking about? Um, number seven, COVID-19 constitutes a public nuisance and a threat. Um, let's define public nuisance. Also, the definition of public nuisance is an act or a person that, um, that affects the public at whole negatively. COVID the virus is a virus. It is not an act, it is not a person. So I, I would argue that the public nuisance is actually all of the secondary things that happen. If you're exposed, then you have to X, Y, Z, right? If you're exposed, Two minutes. then you have to, you know, continue on that down that path. So those would be the nuisances. Wearing a mask would be a nuisance um, to me. Um, <clears throat> Number eight, I think we people have already talked about, but not all face masks are created equal. And so it would be wise to consider, okay, so are you gonna regulate that a person's face covering is up to an exact par that is actually preventative? Or is it just as long as someone's covering your face, maybe being specific in your face coverings? And um, let's see, I think the last one is, oh yeah, um, in num number 10, and um, it will keep businesses open, encouraging economic growth. Again, that doesn't take into account. I do not take my kids out in public. I do not want them wearing masks. I do not go out in public. I'm shopping a lot more online. Um, so we're losing business that way. One minute. And um, number 11, 
it is just improper for the city council to exercise their authority. So I guess I would just ask you in conclusion, is this the state of emergency mandate? Is this, are we in a state of emergency? Is 0 0.0048 a state of emergency? Um, I think we would do well to save a very important part of our due process with a government having the emergency mandate, save that for an actual emergency um, and not use it currently during this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Hello, we, my name is... Just real quick, because we, we've had a number of people join. We're doing five minutes. I'll give a couple of warnings in there. And then because we do have people waiting and we're trying to social distance in here, once somebody's done, um, not requiring you to leave, but out of courtesy, if you would leave, that'll free up spot for somebody else. Go ahead, okay. I'm sorry. Um, my name is Alberta Michaels and I am a resident of Papillion. And I'm just gonna personally, I vote against the mass mandate. I don't have a speech prepared or anything. I'm just, I'm just, I'm seeing our freedoms being taken away little by little and I'm here to vote, I guess, against the mask mandate. Thank you. And that's all. Next. Welcome. Hello, my name is Nick Panko, a resident of Papillion. <clears throat> and I wanna thank the city council for letting me speak tonight. Um, I just have a couple, I did uh, send these in as well, but I just like to kind of uh, go through the points of why I don't think a mass ordinance is necessary. Um, first and foremost, just from my observation, and I think from around town, um, you know, 90% of the people are already wearing masks when they're required to or asked to. Uh, Black Friday shopping, um, if, you, if anybody was out, um, everybody was wearing one. Um, very few people, actually, I went to Best Buy, didn't see any. Um, and actually it's in the country, uh, the lowest state is like 88% of the people are wearing masks when they're asked to, uh, even when there's not a mandate or an ordinance to do that. So I just don't think it's necessary when people are already complying. Um, and I don't think the 10% the that we think are not, I don't think they're super spreaders or any type of inflammatory languages that they're going to spread COVID to everybody else is getting, getting it. The other thing with masks that I think we have to realize is that they're very they're not very effective. Um, and the CDC doesn't think that as well, uh, especially with when they go through their uh, quarantining procedures, uh, when they have to do, when they look at uh, the individuals uh, with your contact tracing, if you're with an individual for, you know, within six feet for over 15 minutes, with or without a mask, you still have to quarantine. So if they were effective, then you wouldn't have to quarantine. But the fact is, if somebody here in this room has COVID, we're all within six feet. At the end of 15 minutes, the masks don't matter. So I just don't think they're necessary, even when the CDC uh, kind of has that same uh, opinion of them as well. The biggest thing I think we need to focus on is how do we enforce the mandate? Um, how do we make it effective? Um, we can look at what you know Omaha has done. Um, as of August, right, that's when they put in their mask ordinance, uh, excuse me if I kind of use the verbiage uh, wrong or incorrectly. Uh, as of August and as of last week, they had zero citations um, of their ordinance. So if before the ordinance, people weren't complying, and then after the ordinance, wouldn't there be so many citations because all these people are not complying? Well, there's two things. One is Omaha police have come out and said they didn't want to write citations. That's not really what they want to do. Uh, they want to, you know, fight crime and police uh, things, and they want to just kind of get voluntary compliance. But now, as you see, Omaha City Council wants the police to do a better job of, of citing people. Well, that's not really making the masks work better or worse. It's just writing citations. That's all that's going to do. So how do we enforce that mandate? Um, Two minutes. And what are the penalties? You know, what are the penalties that we do this? Are we going to shut businesses down if they have multiple citations or multiple violations? Um, and, and are we gonna allow people to report on other people for not wearing their masks? I think that's, uh, that's just wrong to have people kind of tell on other people when they, don't, when they don't do something. I think we need to give each other's grace. The other thing I think we need to think about is, are we gonna enforce the schools? Are we gonna have police officers going to the schools and 
write tickets to the kids to give to their parents because they owe them 25 bucks because they didn't wear their mask correctly. I think the schools are a great example. They've been doing it for over 15 weeks. Uh, they have very limited cases. The kids are complying. That's one of our biggest close contact areas and they are complying, they're doing a good job. Um, how do we measure when the mask mandate should be taken off? Are we gonna use positivity rate? We're gonna use when cases drop. Um, positivity rate is not a measure, according to John Hopkins and the CDC. One minute. That should be used for policy decisions. Um, it's not a measure of how prevalent the virus is in community. All it is is how our testing capacity is going. I think the, uh, the biggest thing is also now that we make this ordinance, um, what are, how are we going to get the police to actually enforce this? Because um, if they don't enforce it, are we gonna give them disciplinary actions because they're not writing citations enough or people aren't getting to wear masks enough? So the last two things I, I need to share is what happens if we've already had COVID? Um, we have some level of immunity for some period of time. Um, why do I need to wear a mask if I don't have it? And then two, which I think is a big thing, uh, December 11th, December 18th, we have two vaccines that are gonna be released into the public. If we get vaccinated, do I need to wear a mask? Um, if I don't have it, I can't give it. And if I have a vaccine, I can't get it. Thank so you. I don't need to wear a mask. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we've been asking some to leave just to free up room, but I understand there's nobody else waiting. So if you wanna stay, feel free to. Welcome. Hi there. My name is Dr. Tapper. I, uh, I am a doctor here in Omaha, Nebraska. Can you state your address for the record? 16909 Burke Street. I came here tonight. It was my night to put the children to bed. I have nothing to gain by being here tonight, but everything to lose. In fact, my wife didn't want me to be here tonight because she thinks this is a waste of time for me to speak out. She said that you guys have your, maids, your minds made up and I beg to differ. I stand by the quote that you never know how far reaching something you may think say to today will affect the lives of millions tomorrow. We, we all want the same thing, don't we? We want healthy people. I am a doctor of prevention. I am a doctor of wellness. That's what I specialize in. I am a nerd. I spend lots of time studying NVSS numbers from the CDC. I put on flu workshops and I have been for many years. And I have some concerns about what, where we're headed. I'm not here to tell you and argue and debate whether these masks are effective or ineffective because we can sit here all night. I can show you peer reviewed articles and studies from the, the <laughs> that were published in the advisory, uh, I'm sorry, the American Association for associations for physicians and surgeons. But what I'm here to tell you is that we're basing all of these lockdowns, these restrictions, these mandates on faulty testing. In other words, we, have, we don't have a pandemic of people falling over dead. What we have is a pandemic of false positives. In fact, I wanna ask you the question, do you know who Carrie Mollis is? Do you know any of you? Do you know who that name is? Does that name ring a bell? Well, you should. Because all of these lockdowns and restrictions and mandates are based off of his test, the PCR test. He invented this test in 2015. He died last year. I have videos. If you want, I will send you the interview of him stating this exact, and I quote, anyone can test positive for practically anything with a PCR test. If you run it long enough with PCR, you do it well, you can find almost anything in anybody. It doesn't tell you that you're sick. This test was never meant to be diagnostic. It doesn't tell you whether you're sick or not. This test is a DNA grab. We do a culture swab in the posterior cavity of the sinuses. If this is such a deadly disease, why can't we swab your mask? Why can't we do saliva? Uh, you're telling me you need to go three inches deep in the posterior cavity, millimeters from the brain, the blood brain barrier to do a swab test. Two minutes. Clinical is 101. 
this type of test needs subjective, it needs symptomatology, and it needs objective findings to correlate and not only correlate, but correspond to the diagnosis, to confirm the diagnosis. An asymptomatic person has neither. That tells you that this is a faulty testing. That is clinicals 101. So why do we have this faulty testing? If you were paying attention last year, the ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice stated last year that we can't force vaccinate anybody, but we can force compliance. The World Health Organization last year stated that the greatest threat to the health, to the health of the world are people who refuse vaccinations or unvaccinated people. This mask mandate will soon turn into a vaccine one. And I will be here in two months when that happens. Pfizer and Moderna are lobbying our government right now to push mandated vaccines. One they, minute. There were bills last year sweeping our nation to eradicate medical freedoms, and we need to understand that. Martin Luther King Jr. stated that the ultimate measure of a man or woman is not where he stands in times of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in, in conflict and controversy. We don't have medical freedom here. We have a medical dictatorship knocking on our doorstep. 30 seconds. And if you vote yes to this, you're letting them in the door. Please, no comments for decorum, no clapping. I mean no disrespect to you, nor the doctors or the nurses in this world, because they are the hardest working people on the planet. But I stand before you today as a doctor of integrity, someone who cares deeply for this country and our people, for my children. Because our freedom is at stake here, and you vote yes, you just eradicated freedom. Thank you. Freedom isn't safe, but it's the safest thing we have. Next. If you'd state your name and address for the record. Uh, Allie French, 4213 North 172nd Street, Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I wasn't really planning on coming out tonight, but I heard you guys motion to have public comment tonight. We weren't expecting that until tomorrow. Um, we have an, a very active group that has coordinated across the entire state as mask mandates sweep across every city of this state, quite conveniently right before the holidays. Um, and, and honestly, guys, I'm not sure exactly what you need to hear to understand that a mask mandate isn't going to change anything. It's not going to save anybody's lives, but what it is going to do is destroy our economy. It is going to destroy the future of our children, both psychologically and physically. We are going to see brain damage from children wearing masks for extended periods of time. We see bacteria and um, mold growing in the masks of the children when they come home from school. I also want to talk about the testing, which we know. Um, Um, when this comes up, okay. So even if you test positive, the PCR testing that we are using doesn't mean that you can transmit anything, okay? Just a positive test, if you are asymptomatic, you cannot get anybody sick. You can't transmit it. You're not sick. Nobody's going to get sick from you. You're not gonna pass it on to somebody else, okay? It just means that there is a protein in your body that can trigger a positive response for the PCR test. We've even found that when you get the flu shot, it can cause a positive detection of coronavirus. So any person who's gotten a flu shot can test positive for a COVID test. We also know, and we can move on to another one, that more than, more than half of the positives are likely to be false, potentially all of them. We know that for surgeons, when they wear masks, even in a room that has added oxygen, they're blood oxygen levels decrease after an hour. Guess what guys, that's in a sterilized environment. They're adding extra oxygen into the room and they are still affected by masks. The other commonality with surgeons is that medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States. And when they looked at this study, they actually asked themselves, is the lowering of blood oxygen, which decreases the oxygen reaching your brain, causing these people to make more mistakes? Is this, could this be a contributing factor to the leading cause of death in the United States? This is huge. So what are we doing to people in a contaminated environment? When we are out here in, an air, in a room or a building or outdoors where there are pollutants around us at all times, 
where you are not in a sterilized environment and you're rebreathing those toxins and your masks are clogging both from the outside and the inside. And when you breathe and it gets moist, you're now cr creating a fantastic environment Two for minutes. breeding bacteria and mold growth, which is what happened in 1918 when we had the Spanish flu and masks were huge. And the number one killer was bacterial pneumonia, which was caused by mass public mask wearing. This isn't new. We have known forever that masks cannot stop viral spread. If masks could stop viral spread, don't you think that 3M, our neighbor, would have been selling them for that very purpose for the last 60 years? This doesn't just change overnight for a virus that is smaller than the viruses that we know everything about. Masks don't work. If you guys want to promote health, if you want to mandate health and kindness, Masks aren't your answer. You're going to be better off telling people that they need to up their vitamin D, that they need to make sure that they are low on comorbidities, which are the leading cause of death when infected with COVID. One minute. There are better answers than a mask. But what a mask is going to do is cause division in your community, is going to cause people to be attacked and bullied on a daily basis, is it's going to cause neighbors to call on other neighbors and other businesses. I'm pretty sure the last time we learned about that in school, we were talking about the Holocaust, and I don't take that lightly. That's not offensive, guys. We need to wake up and realize how drastic this is. When you pit people against each other for beliefs, I'm allowed to not believe in what the medical community believes in. That is what our country is founded upon, and you don't get to take that away from anybody. So I'm calling on you guys to rule in a constitutional manner. Our country is a constitutional republic, and we rule based on individual rights, not mob mentality, and not the medical mafia. They do not rule what we do, and we need somebody to stand up and recognize that. Somebody. If you guys are the first to do it, I promise you others will follow. I promise you, you will have the support of the people. I understand there are people who oppose this mandate, and Thank they you. are very loud, Next. but they're not the majority. Thank Next. you. Do you guys have a record I can yeah. submit this to? Give it to Ms. Brown. Hi. If you'd state your name and address for the record. Yeah, uh, Brittany, 1105 Gold Coast Road. And this is Easty. Okay, so this is like my five thousand time talking at a city council meeting about a mask mandate. So. I just wrote this in probably 15 minutes because I thought we were speaking tomorrow. Okay. Hi, my name is Brittany and this is Easton and we're not being paid to be here. I have, I'm speaking here tonight because I have grown up here. I have played sports and I'm a crier. I went to school here and now I'm raising my family here in Papillion, Nebraska, where we are ranked 1,397 to raise a family where we are ranked 2,054 in the USA as one of the best places to live. I'm referencing Dr. Lee Merritt, who is a formal naval surgeon with an expertise in biowarfare. She recently attended a white coat ceremony in DC and she had spoke at a Omaha City Council meeting where 89% of people who have had COVID usually or always wore masks. 3.9 of the people who have COVID never wore masks. Clearly something is not working. We had a school teacher last meeting in La Vista with a super sad story of kids getting COVID and passing it to other classmates. Well, aren't they wearing masks? Her excuse was they're hanging out with groups of kids outside of school, but then they're coming back yet still wearing masks. I am a mom to two healthy boys and praise the Lord, four and 16 months. I literally take them everywhere with me. I stay home. My kids have never had fevers, never had an over-the-counter the medicine. Why? I feed them vitamins, sunshine, chiropractic care by Dr. Ben. We eat healthy, no sugars, and no masks. I have been with a group of moms. All together, we have over 35 plus kids. We have been together ever since we have been flattening the curve back in February, playing on the playgrounds. We are with each other literally every weekend, multiple times a week, and none of us wear masks and none of our kids have gotten sick. 
I just wish you would hear out other doctors speak other than those being paid by UNMC. We have studies that have been done showing masks don't work. Unfortunately, this is about power politics and money. It's almost as if UNMC gets paid $374,000 per COVID. COVID has a 99% survival rate. 99% survival rate. And can we give it up for the flu for being gone? <sighs> okay, so I'm going to go off to script for a second. I feel my safest shopping here in Papillion. I get my business here everywhere I go. I feed my kids healthy. We went to Trader Joe's a couple months ago when mask mandates weren't even big because their door had a sign that said I had to wear a mask. I can't wear a mask. I actually have a medical condition. Two minutes. I was harassed going into the store, in the store, and on my way out. They don't take your groceries out. And I was escorted by a six foot three man harassing me at my car with these two. I called corporate. I don't want that here. I spoke of this last at the meeting in La Vista about my situation. And yet after the meeting, when council members are able to talk, uh, one of the city council members who was on this side, don't know his name, mocked me. Yes, we can take our vitamins. Yes, we can exercise. And yes, we can wear a mask. And I left. I thought, I, I thought they said I was not going to be harassed. It's in the ordinance that medical exemptions, you're exempted. Also, it was my understanding that y'all denied a freedom of info request of a PCR test where Michael Polk responded using a taxpayer's funds. One minute. Why would, deny, why would you deny public records when she is giving you advice to pass this mask ordinance and yet she is not giving it to us her attorney had to email us what is going on you're hiding something i guess my last questions are why why are you now doing this what money is being offered and everybody will be held accountable one day this is not where i want to raise my family anymore if this happens papillion is a small town i've had Actually, Mr. Glover was a principal when I was there. And 30, I know some seconds. of your guys' kids who have had COVID wearing masks. Something is not working. Thank you. Next. Yeah, you can get uh, Ms. Brown. Thank you. Hi. Hold on a second. Can you state your name and address for the record? Sure thing. Samantha Cummins, 5025 South 107th. Um, I am a wife, I am a mother, and I'm somebody who is very protective of our freedoms. I speak for many of us when I say we're not okay with losing our personal liberties because of lies and fear. These masks do not stop the spread of any virus, especially the way that they're worn. Logically, this, doesn't, this just doesn't make sense. I'm sure people have brought it to your attention. Um, for one example, walking into a restaurant, you have to have your mask on, you squat down and you can take it off. Just doesn't make sense. Um, so to you guys who are making this decision and to those who want to enforce it, I just wanna remind you that soon we're gonna be at a full year of these lockdowns of being told to wear a mask and hardly any changes have been made in the numbers of the cases. So why now? What's gonna change nine months later? I'd also urge you to understand that a rise in cases does not equal a rise in deaths. The more cases we see, the less people are dying, the higher the um, survival rate is. I urge you to remember a world where we quarantined the sick and we protected the compromised and we did not do this to the healthy, where we enjoyed human contact and socialization and not everybody was at war with each other. I urge you to research the particle size of the virus and what can fit through the mask that most of us wear each day. Not me, but other people. I understand this is something that some of you can feel compelled to vote for. You wanna do something for the greater good. You wanna save lives. Um, I understand the pressure that you have coming from all sides of this, um, but on our end, we are very informed we're not going away. We don't accept the new normal. We don't accept a mask mandate. 
And to those willing to give away all of our rights until you wake up, we'll fight for you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hello, my name is Tanya Cloyd um, and I live on Inglewood Drive in Eagle Hills. Is that good enough? Is that okay. Okay. Um, I just want to say I'm a wife, I'm a mother to three, and I've always homeschooled our children. So I just want to kind of put that out there. But here we go. There are people who cannot wear masks, myself included, and I am disheartened by being spoken to as if I'm an immediate threat everywhere I go or talk to as if I'm a dangerous, irresponsible human being because of it. It is not irresponsible of me to breathe the way God designed and intends all of us to breathe, and therefore it absolutely does not deserve punishment, period. Yet here we are seeking to punish citizens, even though papillion businesses and schools can enforce this just fine as needed without you. I know our city council members and the members of the public who support this ordinance are wanting to help. And I'm sure passing this easily seems like the right thing to do because let's face it, we also know the angry mob will claim it's now going to be your fault that people are still dying in our community if you don't do this. But I'm here to tell you it is not your fault. It never has been and it never will be your fault. Your heart is in a good place, okay, I know that. You truly do intend to help by passing this, but just listen for a second to what else you'd actually be enabling with this. Isolation, segregation, using a method of coercion to ban law-abiding citizens from freely moving about Papillion, specifically free from harassment and or being treated like a second-class citizen. This is not okay and the main reason why I'm here today. If this passes, the majority of the public will hear this news via the media. It will be shared with a sense of urgency that makes the community believe covering your face is now the law and how we can now report violators to the police hotline to receive their $25 citation. I'm calling on the Papillion City Council along with Mayor David Black and especially the media to report this responsibly. People make it known, or <coughs> please make it known that this mask ordinance has exemptions and that you absolutely do not condone any member of the public to bully or harass someone who's specifically, or who's respectfully shopping in a store and unable to cover their face. We need to be kind and think before we speak. There are things like physical health, mental health, PTSD, like prisoners of war, abused, kidnapped and raped victims, even religious reasons why people do not veil their faces. All of these circumstances naturally trump a mask ordinance and people need to be made aware of it. The final thing I wanna talk about is UNMC. Listen, I really do love our doctors and nurses. We need them. They have the biggest hearts to be in their profession. But UNMC also has a huge responsibility. People listen to them here, especially a terrified public. We've all apparently agreed to do whatever they tell us because well, they're the experts, the front lines, the science. Two minutes. But all we're hearing is the repeating of exactly what they're told to repeat from the top without even questioning any of it. They're told to share this with public officials and post that on social media. I've been going to many city council meetings regarding masks in the Omaha area and, I've, and I'm overseeing UNMC being called on for expert advice and listening to them beg that we slap a mask over everyone's face all because their graph says that it will work when in real time it does just the opposite. Yet like clockwork, we're reassured with the predictable phrase, well, just imagine what our numbers would be like without the ordinance in place. No, you're buying into a false sense of security to believe these masks can do what even their manufacturers say they cannot. Oh, I lost my place. Um, the hospital is still nearing capacity. The staff is still run down and overwhelmed. We can all hear them loud and clear. If they truly want to break through and need a break, like they say, they need to start telling our community to take care of their God-given immune systems. One we minute. need to work with our bodies, not against them, by suppressing the natural function by which they were designed. Urge the people to start taking vitamin D3, vitamin C, zinc, and I will say it again, oregano. We know that for the vast majority, these work at lessening the severity of symptoms by far, which lowers your chances of ending up in the hospital by far. Can you tell me why there's no talk on this? Absolute silence. 
I'm really starting to feel bad for the front line. Some of those who I have spoken to personally who want to speak out on seconds. vitamin deficiency in these patients, but can't. UNMC is keeping the community in a state of ignorance to what could really be helping us and their staff during this time. This is the irresponsibility that needs to be called into question. Not someone like me who can kindly distance myself from others and respectfully use self-checkout when shopping. Please don't vote to enable isolation, segregation, and coercion by punishment for something that you're told is going to work but won't. In fact, researchers this past week withdrew a study showing the efficacy of mask mandates when it was observed virus cases are instead increasing after the fact. Thank you. Please critically think. Thank you. Thank you. Next. You can state your name and address for the record. Okay, so I have a question about that because I'm a foster parent and I really don't need my littles being exposed to their birth parents. Can I just give like an, a street? Yeah. Okay, I'm Natasha Gall in 92nd Avenue. Um, so I didn't really plan on talking, first of all, because we didn't think there was going to be public comment tonight. So I'm glad they let us know. Um, but so I'm a wife for 17 years. Um, I have six kids. I said I'm a foster parent and I have immunocompromised children. I use that term lightly because I take health very seriously. Um, I have a little girl who has a seizure disorder. Guess who hasn't had a seizure since she came to us? And why is that? Because I took preventative care. I got her on vitamins. I got her on bone broth. Super simple guys, but it helps your gut fight everything off. So I got her on vitamins. I got her on natural things. And I made sure that she got the vitamin D that she needs. All the things that all these guys have talked about. This isn't new stuff. This science isn't settled is legit because there's that science that tells us that she should be on phenobarbital, which is a neuro inhibitor, which kept her to where she wasn't ever supposed to be able to sit up. She wasn't ever supposed to be able to crawl, to talk, to walk. And my husband came and picked her up. But if you ask these guys, she's probably the sassiest little three-year-old you've ever met. And she does all of that because we got her off phenobarbital. Now, to some people, it may actually be needed, but to her, it wasn't because I was able to correct what was going on in her little brain. She has no long-term neurological damage. I have another little guy that when he came to us, he was so malnutritioned, it wasn't even funny. He came to us at three. He couldn't even talk. He couldn't nothing. I can't wear a mask around him because he, he, he was never taught. He wasn't ever shown correct facial expressions. So I even struggle looking at your eyes, knowing how you're feeling about me. And I was raised in somewhat similar situations. So I struggle with knowing what, what are you trying to say to me with your eyes? I don't know. He can't obey if I'm wearing a mask, I've done it once. And that's because I was forced to at children's because he's my foster son and I can't deny him medical services at that time. If he was mine, I would have found a different eye doctor and gone to, but I couldn't. I have another little guy who is, has severe brain issues, but he's immunocompromised because of it. I got him on all the vitamins. So if we're really worried about our hospitals and our medical staff, because I have a sister who's a PA, a sister who's an RN, and my best friend is an RN. If we're worried about how we're overworking them, because we are, then we need to be teaching preventative care. What do you do to up your immune system? Especially now as we're coming into the season where we're not outside as often. What are we doing to up our immune system Two to minutes. help us be able to fight things off? I'm part of a group that I don't remember which one. I think maybe Britt talked about. I bring six of those 35 kids. <laughs> um, we've gone everywhere. And my kids lick everything, you guys. They're kids. It's just what they do. And not even a runny nose no allergies, no nothing. And it's not because they have amazing genetics. Genetics kind of screw us over half the time, but we have the ability and we have the resources out there. Why are we not trying to take away some of the stress 
that our medical system is getting. My sister called me yesterday and she's exhausted because of how much they're working her. It's not that I don't care about them. It's that I want us looking at this from a different perspective because there are different perspectives and there are vitamins that you can take to help. There is so much that we can do to help our medical system not be overtaxed. But it maybe if we did that, we wouldn't have nurses and doctors leaving by droves at hospitals across the state because I've gone across the state to these mask mandate meetings. It's getting ridiculous because we're wearing them down because we're not talking about preventative care. 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Um, so the, oh, go ahead. Hi, my name is Dorothy Reyes, um, 1019 Conestoga Road. Um, I lived in La Vista for 19 years and we moved here in four years. Four years ago, um, I love coming down the street, you guys, because, and especially this time of year, it's like, it reminds me of everything that America represents, you know, just the brightness, the lights, the joy, just the small town feel. The other day I was driving, there was a little man by the nativity scene and he was sitting on a lawn chair and he had a sign out that said free prayer. And he was offering it people, to people that stopped by, you know, that, that's America. That's what I know America to be, this town to be. And forgive me, I don't mean to be insulting whatsoever, but I look right now at all of this with these masks. And I ask you, are you that afraid to die that you are doing this to yourselves? You know, it, it reminds me of communist China. And for the things that are to come yet, due to these mandates, due to putting something on the people. I don't even know why we're here. I go to the grocery stores, I go to the gas stations, I go to Target, wherever. Almost everybody is wearing a mask. Why are we even imposing a mandate for this? Is it because Omaha did it? Is it because Bellevue, I believe they just passed theirs, La Vista, Gretna? I mean, is, is that why? Because you're wanting to follow suit? Don't follow suit on this. This is nothing to do with health. This has everything to do with dictating to the people, to your citizens. I'm not responsible for your health and you're not responsible for mine. There are precautions we can take. I'm not saying COVID is not a real thing. I'm also saying there's preventative measures that were spoken before tonight that we can take. We gotta unmask these children. My God, what are we doing to them? What effect is this going to have on them long-term? I can't even believe, I can't even believe we're standing here tonight. I can't believe that this is the world that we are living in from nine, 10 months ago. We were gonna do two weeks to flatten that curve. And look where we are now. We are so divided as a country over a mask. Two minutes. Is that gonna kill me? Is that gonna protect me? Am I gonna kill her? Am I gonna protect her? It's nonsense. Fauci just released, I believe it was yesterday. You know, we're gonna sit here and we're gonna, we're gonna take advice from the CDC, the UNMC, UNMC. <laughs> they are dictating to everybody. They have become our new government. Fauci yesterday, after saying, you know, the, the kids, you know, they're, they're spreaders. They're, you know, they're gonna get this, you get them in school. Now he comes out and says, they're not yesterday. They're not, they're, they're not giving it to people. They're not spreading it amongst each other. 
what are we doing here? Who are we listening to? Is anybody really listening anymore? Or are you just taking the advice? Are you actually doing your research? One minute. And looking on the, on the broad perspective of everything? Or are you just taking the experts from the med center who, <laughs> if you're following Omaha, the um, health director, her husband is big into research there. The mayor there, her husband is a um, surgeon there. 30 seconds. They get funding from the NAIA, uh, NIH. I think it was like $84 million. Who are they, ta what are they researching? Why are we always having to research some, a treatment? Why can't we, why can't we find a cure? You know, why can't we find a cure? Why can't we have an alternative to a pharmaceutical medication? Why can't we have an alternative for you guys listening to what Batman said tonight? You know, what? he's a doctor. He's a doctor of preventative medicine. Why aren't we listening to others? Thank Instead you. of just taking these people's advice. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Um, and again, just more education. And if anybody's watching this, uh, tonight was published as a first reading, which generally is no comments. Tomorrow then is the public hearing. And then published for uh, is Thursday for council discussion and a vote. Um, we follow Robert's rules and we've got our ordinances. So council members have an absolute right to make a motion to open a public hearing. And that's what occurred tonight is council of Mum Mumgard made the motion to open the public hearing since people were here to go ahead and uh, take the testimony. That does not negate tomorrow's public hearing. We'll still have public hearing tomorrow. However, uh, we only allow a person to speak once on the topic. So if you spoke tonight, you will not speak tomorrow. Um, and again, because of social distancing in the limited room, um, we'll ask the people who want to speak tomorrow to be the ones that'll be in the audience tomorrow and then we'll work them through. Um, so we close the public hearing and we'll be back tomorrow at seven. Next on the agenda, item E1, ordinance 1906, an ordinance to amend code sections 1041, 1046, and 1047 regarding declaration of emergencies, emergency powers, and curfews. It's also a public hearing. I'll open it. Do we have any proponents? Do you have any opponents? Yes, sir. And if you'd state your name for the record. Yeah. And just fine. to be fair on all the public hearings, I'm gonna hold by the five minute rule, even though I know there's not that many. Yeah, no, that's fine. So, I think I've got it. I just wanna be fair <laughs> through the whole meeting. Um, uh, yeah, Matt Perry, uh, 803 North Beetle. Um, since June 1st and the adoption of the curfew ordinance, uh, I've talked to just about all of you, I think, besides certain members who need to clear out their inbox or their voicemail. Um, I think I've, I've made my disdain for it as clear as I possibly can. Um, uh, that extends to these modifications found in 1906 as well. Um, while attempting to make the curfew ordinance more palatable, I don't think you guys have gone far enough. I've already beat the constitutional drum and the response I get from most of you guys is, yeah, I agree, but, you know, safety. So let's be crystal clear. Even with these modifications presented in Ordinance 1906, the mayor can still prohibit our ability to express our religion. He can curtail our freedom of speech. He can abridge the freedom of the press. He can restrict our ability to petition our government. And he can stop us from peacefully assembling, even if it's for a 48-hour period. These things can still be done. This ordinance still gives one man the ability to declare an emergency, and then he shall, quote, have power to impose by proclamation any regulations necessary to preserve the peace and order of the city, end quote. And for two days, there's nothing that you guys or any citizen here can do about it, and you guys have given him that power. All these modifications do is shorten the amount of time from what it previously was, which I think was three days, and I could be off on that. I think that's what it was though. Reduces it down to two days and requires the chief of police and Councilman Stuby to high five him as he does it. How unfamiliar do you have to be with history to not see that this is a bad idea? 
Every single one of you are relying on the argument, and you guys have all told me this, you're relying on the argument that the mayor is a good man. Maybe you're willing to risk your and your family's freedom on that. I am not. And I would also argue that good men do not seek power like this. This is not something that good men want to be given to them. Papillion has survived for 150 years without an ordinance like this. Why is it that no other Papillion City Council prior to this one has passed something similar? Some of you have told me it's because you believe that we live in a different time and we're experiencing things that prior city councils never had to deal with. And you might be right, but times of trouble aren't the time to ab uh, abandon our principles and throw out our founding documents. Times of trouble are when we should be clinging to those things. Two minutes. On May 31st of this year, some socialists on the internet threatened to destroy our community, and you responded by punishing the citizens. And in doing so, you gave them the reaction that all bullies want. You showed them that we're afraid. When nothing happened, instead of saying, oops, we overreacted, you guys doubled down and said, yeah, but next time they might actually show up. Really? Are we not made of tougher stuff than that? Is our fortitude so lacking that our answer to a threat is to clutch our pearls, hide in our house, and give unlimited power for 48 hours to our mayor? That's the best we can come up with to internet threats? Free societies can survive a lot. They can survive riots and unrest. They can even survive viruses and pandemics. What they can't survive is tyranny and despotism. Not only, I should say, not without conflict anyway. One minute. Nebraska state statutes already give the mayor the ability to declare a state of emergency. You guys have made that very clear. That's enough power. That's good enough. He does not need more. And I don't mean just <laughs> Mayor Black. I mean anybody who sits in that seat. They do not need more than what the state already grants them. Stop using people's fear to seize more authority for yourselves. Stop trying to control people. And I, I think you guys have heard pretty passionately here tonight. People are tired of being meddled with. 30 seconds. We don't need to be told what to do. It's not your job um, to decide what's best for me and my family. That, that's, that's my job. And it's your job to do that with yours. So please, I'm begging you guys, um, that however you vote on this, these, these amendments, just get rid of this ordinance. It, we don't need it. It doesn't need to exist. That's it. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, sir. My name is Matt Matheson. I live at 802 North Beetle. I am uh, neighbors with Mr. Perry. I agree wholeheartedly with everything he just said. I didn't prepare anything tonight uh, because quite frankly, I struggled to. Every time I sat down to write something, all I could come up with was angry vitriol. Over one thing in particular, I spoke to many of you. Uh, there was a line I had, I had immense problem with in this ordinance, and that is the any and all line power given to the mayor when an emergency is declared. Um, it didn't pass my notice that you did place some restriction and separation of power there. Uh, I share the same concerns Mr. Perry does with that, but I cannot read those and not think things like despotism and tyranny. And I realize this sounds hyperbolic and it angers me that I can't say things like that without feeling some sort of mm, pulling back and concern for what you might think of me being extreme. Um, that also angers me because I, I, I question how far this country is going to go as you have heard this evening through all of the testimony given about the masks How far is it going to go before me saying things like that have ramifications as well, especially before a ruling body? It makes me fearful for raising my children in a community 
that thinks that they can tell grown men what time to come inside. I don't care what the reason is. I'm trying very difficultly to keep my ire, but it is becoming more difficult. It is becoming more difficult every day as I watch the news or try not to. So I don't have much more to say other than that, other than I am very disappointed that this is the place that my country has gotten and very disappointed that this is the place that my town has gotten. To think for no reason at all, six months after some riots occurred in downtown Omaha that we are still talking about restricting peaceable citizens for no threat. There was no threat that day. There is no threat now. There is no reason for this ordinance. So I hope that this council will consider these things. Two minutes. I hope that I am not of a remaining few free thinking and liberty minded people. I noticed at the corner of Halleck Park, there's a memorial honoring those who have served this country and the armed forces. Again, I feel this is hyperbolic, but I'm gonna bring it up. Those men served a principle of liberty. They fought for a country that valued liberty. Some of them died for a country that valued liberty. liberty. And that liberty is what made their sacrifice noble. It's what made it worth a memorial. This council, I believe, approved that. How can you impose curfews and carte blanche power to any man for any reason One minute. and still put up a memorial like that? What did those men serve and why is it worthy of any note? If these things are to be taken so lightly as to dismiss the entirety of the Constitution and overrule it with an ordinance. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Sir? Oh, <laughs> Mr. Mumgard. Yeah. I, you and I have talked many times. Yes. And here's, here's my problem. I, I, I tend to agree with a whole lot of what you say when we focus on civil disobedience, protest, et cetera. But I, I don't know that I'm willing to completely throw out curfews because I look at situations such as a tornado that wipes out a good section of town. You know, it, it, we see it. We're in the Midwest. You've grown up and we see that. And I see that there can be situations such as that when it, you know, the, the scope is beyond what law enforcement can adequately handle to keep looters and other people who are intent on bad things out of that area. So I think, how do you deal with that kind of a situation without a curfew? So I'm not willing, and, and I tried to deal with it by focusing on the definition of an emergency, which I don't think that the definition of emergency in this ordinance really covers what we saw last summer. So I'm not willing to throw out a curfew entirely because I look at that other kind of situation. And so what's your reaction to that? My reaction is, I believe that it is still illegal to loot. I believe that there are property rights. I don't know how you reconcile both of those things. I do know there are adequate laws in the books to deal with criminals and criminal behavior. Peaceable, peaceable citizens ought not be told that they cannot come and go freely from this town as a whole. I would have preferred more nuanced language in an ordinance dealing with that specifically. My, my most uh, thing that I am irritated most about is the any and all things possible to yeah. maintain. I spoke with you and Mr. Mumgard and several of you about that clause specifically and 
Some even addressed removing it. However, it remained. One man ought not have that power. Freedom-loving people do not write things like that into ordinances. The first time could have been oversight. It was copied from another city's ordinance. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know who writes these. To see it again after a call for revision, it greatly angered me. It made me have a very little faith that this council will dismiss it or edit it further. And I am very, very disappointed that we see such an outpouring over wearing a mask, which I also don't want to do. However, it does not carry with it the weight that this ordinance does should an emergency be declared for any period of time or any council voting to extend such powers to the mayor. I find it very troubling. That answer your question, Mr. Mumgard? Well, well okay, yeah, and, I, and I, let's look at that any and all things. If we change that to say that the mayor may do any reasonable, may take any reasonable measures as are necessary to preserve. How about lawful? How about lawful measures? You know, how about how about uh, constitutionally not like not infringing the constitution measures? I I I don't see why any and all is is there. Sure, the, I, and and I I it, see what you're saying, and I don't entirely disagree with you on that. It's pretty I, broad. And and to be to be frank, uh, I'll probably always disagree with you on curfews. Okay. However, I uh, I can swallow a law that says in natural disaster, you know, a curfew could be placed over a specific area for a specific reason. But I cannot swallow any man having any and all power. Did that answer your question, Mr. Mumgard? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next is item E two ordinance. Oh, I'm sorry, we're still on public hearing. Go ahead. Okay, my name is Roy Hurd, uh, 1102 Hickory Hill Road. Um, again, all the good stuff's been said. I just want to add my hearty amen to what these people have said. And just, again, think about this. You know, you've got a lot of power to one, one person and, and, and what's the worst going to happen? You know, I mean, if say there is a big COVID outbreak and you declare a national, I mean, national, you declare a state of emergency in the city, then what? Then it just it goes downhill from there. The possibilities are endless. This is ripe for abuse. Our founding fathers put these things in the constitution to prevent government from doing these things. And here we are, or you are, are trying to do the exact things that the constitution prevents. That's all I got, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, my name is Edward Winninger. I live in Walnut Creek. Um, I wanted to address your question, uh, Councilman Mumgard. Um, my best answer I have is, and I'm sure there are different feelings on the council about this, but um, if, if a business or, or an area was destroyed in a tornado, or, um, we, we, I think we saw a pretty good uh, instance of uh, appropriate response with J Jacob Gardner down in Omaha. And I think that um, he was there defending his business legally, lawfully, and constitutionally. Um, and unfortunately, it became a, a, an issue sidetracked and derailed by other circumstances. But at the end of the day, I think he um, is probably a good example of what uh, action to take in, a, in that sort of situation. Um, so, and I also, the other thing I want to address, uh, which, which people mentioned, uh, or there was a mentioned response from certain uh, councilmen, which I didn't actually hear, council members, which I didn't actually hear, but it was mentioned. And so I uh, wanted to, to, to add a point to it is that, um, you know, this, this measure is uh, uh, required because we live in different times. I think it was something to that effect, somebody said. And um, I guess my, my, I've seen pictures of downtown Papillion. Um, you know, we've been around as a city for uh, quite a while now. And, um, you know, I'm sure there was a time when, you know, men, uh, most men wore sidearms as they were walking around downtown and um, there were probably some scuffles in the street and such. And so I don't think this is not a different time than that, right? Like we're more civilized, we're more evolved, we're more modern, right? Like, but, but there's precedent like this, they survived those times without this sort of uh, 
uh, measure being taken. So, um, in 1886, I wasn't here when uh, for those hearings or when that was passed. Um, but but the the it, it states in light of the violent events and threat of further civil unrest in the Omaha metropolitan area, it would be appropriate to authorize the mayor as the city's chief executive officer to declare emergencies and to issue related emergency orders such as curfew rules. Um, we we haven't had any violent events recently um, since the election. Uh, Antifa uh, has packed up, gone home basically, and pretty much non-existent. Um, and so, I, why are we still? Why do, why does that still exist? Right? Why does 1886 still exist? And why are we considering? Or why 1906 as well? Why does that exist? Um, those those times have passed. Um, but what if they do come back? Um, let's let's game this out. And I'll talk very hypothetically. I have not talked to Chief Lines about this. Just Fun scenarios, uh, I you know play on my head, but two minutes to the extreme. Um, we have a limited number of police officers. I'm sure there are escalation protocols in place that involve state resources, but we also have a constitutional right to form militia. What if a citizen with a weapon is providing overwatch in some extraordinary circumstances where we have to defend our city? Right, a, a tornado comes through. Right, we have there's mass confusion, uh, resources are scarce, uh, people are just trying to apply first aid everywhere. Who gets arrested and who does not if they are out late at night? Is a police officer gonna be able to determine between a juvenile out trying to get a big screen TV versus somebody out trying to apply uh, uh, first aid to people and help transport supplies? Um, just look at Kyle Rittenhouse, the circumstances of that night, people running everywhere, right? How does how is a police officer going to determine? Um, and they didn't even they didn't even identify Kyle Rittenhouse properly, right? They walked right past him. Um, One they, minute. they did not know uh, in the midst of all that what was going on. And police and emergency response units will potentially need help. And we're trapped in our home, unable to help fellow citizens. So who gets arrested and who does not after whatever time at night lockdown is called the law abiding second amendment citizen or the terrorist trying to vandalize businesses 1906 says any extension required after 48 hours will requ required after 48 hours will require council approval under what circumstances is the council going to actually stand up to the mayor we're seconds. already seeing capitulation in unelected experts and state senators from other districts who don't represent Papillion telling us what to do we as americans should not be reliant upon government to protect us domestically Life is full of risk, including going out at night when bad guys are out there. Please revoke 1886 and 1906. Thank you. Anybody else? Now I'll close the public hearing. Thank you. Item E2, Ordinance 1907, an ordinance to approve the vacation of the Courthouse Circle right-of-way. Um, this is one that staff is recommending uh, that we not do, but it was already on the agenda, published as a public hearing, so we don't need to do this one. Um, remember last meeting, this is the one that... Uh, 10, 15 years ago was already taken care of. But a related item that uh, the previous one did not take care of is item E3, ordinance 1908, an ordinance to approve the conveyance of title for that portion of the courthouse circle right of way to be vacated by ordinance 1907. Also a public hearing, any proponents? Any opponents? Close the public hearing. Item F1, resolution R20-0198, a public hearing and a vote. Resolution to approve a preliminary plat for the property legally described as attractive land located in the south half of the northwest quarter and tax lot nine in the northwest quarter and part of the tax lot 10 in the southwest quarter, all in section 15 township 13 north range 11 east of the 6 p.m. Sarpy County, Nebraska, generally located on the southeast corner of south 168th street and Fairview Road. The applicant is OPPD. Public hearing was opened uh, last meeting. It was continued. And OPPD is asking for another continuance indefinitely. Um, they're still working on some final things to come before us. So is there a motion to uh, continue resolution R20-0198? Motion by Councilwoman Kluk, second by Councilman Glover. Any proponents or opponents? Any council discussion? Please vote. Gaines votes yes.
Six yeas, zero nays. Next one's gonna be the same. Um, resolution R20199, that was also a public hearing and a vote that was done at the last meeting, continued. And OPPD is uh, requesting a motion to continue to an indefinite date. So is there a motion to continue resolution R20199? Motion by Councilman Jaworski, second by Councilman Sunday. Any proponents or opponents? Council discussion, please vote. Gaines votes yes. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion passes. Item F3, resolution R20-0214. Resolution to approve posting of the annual occupation tax report to the city's website. So a motion to approve resolution R20-0214. Motion by Councilman Jaworski, second by Councilwoman Klute. Any proponents or opponents? Council discussion, please vote. Gaines votes yes. Eight yeah, zero nays. Motion passes. Item F4, resolution R20-0223. A resolution to approve an assignment and assumption agreement of the Uniform Commercial Purchase Agreement with Invest CRE LLC for the purchase of approximately 0 0.87 acres of property generally located to 226 North Adams Street from Fitch Inc. Is there a motion to approve resolution R20223? Motion by Councilman Jaworski, second by Councilman Kluke. Do you have any proponents or opponents? Any council discussion? Please vote. Gaines votes yes. Eight zero nine. It's all the regular agenda items. I don't think any committees have met, and um, it's the recap of the first meeting. But this is the organizational meeting of the council um, because of the election. So this is a meeting of the old city council. Um, we will then have a new meeting of the new city council and swear in the new members. Typically we take a extended break for the transition and let the old members go away and the new ones come in and a little reception, but everybody got reelected. So I don't know if there's a need for that unless we need a five minute break for uh, bathroom reasons since we've been going two hours. Do we need a break or just move on? Not seeing one, okay. Um, I'll call the meeting to order. And I'll ask the city clerk to read the November 3rd, 2020 official election results. The official election results as certified by the Sarpy County Election Commissioner as follows. City Council Ward 1, James C. Glover, 2,843 votes, write in 43 votes. City Council Ward 2, Jason L. Gaines, 2,011 votes, write in 80 votes. City Council Ward 3, Luann Kluke, 2,028 votes. Kyle L. Salkeld, 959 votes. Write in 17 votes. City Council Ward 4, Bob Stubbe, 2,520 votes. Write in 49 votes. Those persons elected have met all requirements as set forth in state statute section 32-602. Thank you. Would you please take the roll? Sunday. Mumgard. Gaines. Here. Glover. Jaworski. Here. Kluke. Here. Stubbe. Here. Engberg. Here. And we have an affidavit of publication on file still and the Open Meetings Act is still posted in the back of the council chambers. Those members that were uh, reelected will do the oath of office. If you wanna come up to the podium, except for Mr. Gaines, you can stay home. Raise your right hand. I state your name. 
I Jason Gein. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. I'll support the Constitution of the United States. Constitution of the state of Nebraska. Constitution of the state of Nebraska. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. Bear true faith. Bear faith. Allegiance to the same. Allegiance to the I same. take this obligation freely. Take this obligation freely. Without a reservation. Without reservation. Or for the purpose of evasion. Or for the purpose of evasion. I will faithfully and impartially. I will faithfully and impartially. Perform the duties of the office of Papillion City Council member. Perform the duties of the office of Papillion City Council member. According to the law and the best of my ability. According to the law and the best of my ability. I do further swear. I do further swear. Not advocate. Not advocate. I'm a member of. I'm not a member of. Political party or organization. Political party or organization. That advocates the overthrow. That advocates the overthrow. Of the government of the United States. The government of the United States. Or of this state by force or violence. Or of this state by force or violence. And that during such time. And that during such time. I am in this position. I am in this position. I will not advocate. Will not advocate. Or become a member of. Or become a member of. A political party or organization. Political party or organization. That advocates the overthrow. That advocates the overthrow. Government of the United States. Government of the United States. Or of this state. Or of this state. So help me God. So help me God. Yes, congratulations. And since it's an organizational meeting, um, need to elect a council president. And again, since this is televised, use it as education because it only happens once a year. Um, in our former government, uh, mayor's the executive branch, the council's the legislative. Uh, the council amongst themselves every year elects a president. Uh, the only thing, the only additional duty of the president is to fill in for the mayor. Um, so if I can't be at a meeting, that's who presides at the meeting, or if something happens to me and I don't be the mayor anymore, they, that is the secession plan and they become the mayor. Um, so we'll take motions from the council. Anybody can be nominated. We'll take as many nominations as there are. We'll close the floor to nominations. If there's more than one, we will do a secret ballot unless you would choose not to. And if there's only one, I assume you won't do a secret ballot. So is there a motion to open nominations for council president? Motion by Councilman Glover, second by Councilwoman Clute. Please vote. Gaines votes yes. He is her name. The floor is open for nominations. Mr. Glover. Tom Mumgard's nominated. I don't know. I don't think we need a second on that one. Oh, yeah, we do. Are there any other nominations? Close the floor to nominations then. There's only one, so I'm assuming. So do we have a motion to close nominations? Motion by Councilman Kluke, second by Councilman Jaworski, please vote. 
Gaines votes yes. Eight hey, is your nice. So we can still do a secret vote. Probably the only valid one is if you'd vote no and you don't want to know who it was, but that'll show up later anyway. No, not if it's a secret vote. So um, is there a uh, motion to, we got ballots if you need them. <laughs> is there any objection to doing a voice vote? All right, I don't see any. Is there a motion to approve resolution R20018 electing council member Mumgard as council president? Motion by Councilman Clute, second by Councilman Glover, please vote. Gaines votes yes. Eight is zero nays. Motion passes. Congratulations to everybody. Do we have a, well, next is motion to adjourn, but again, just uh, for the public and anybody watching and council, um, we did publish for a public hearing of the mask mandate for tomorrow. Um, we will still have that meeting at seven o'clock. Um, and that's the only thing on the agenda. There will be no council discussion or vote tomorrow night, unless, which is, a league, which is their right to do, a council member makes a motion to waive third reading. Um, then there could be uh, council discussion and vote tomorrow, and that waiver also takes a supermajority. So we won't know that until tomorrow night if we have a meeting on Thursday or not, but we will be here tomorrow night. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion by Councilman Glover. Second by Councilman Jaworski. Please vote. Gaines votes yes. Eight is zero nays. We are adjourned.